Hi, I'm Robert May, a professor emeritus at Purdue University, and I'm very pleased to be with you today presenting to the Civil War Roundtable Congress. And I want to start a few months after Abraham Lincoln's election as president in January of 1861. I want to start with a U.S. Senator from Florida, Senator David Levy Uly. And David Uly sends word to state authorities back in Florida that he favors secession from the Union and wants to create a new nation. He says, what is advisable is the earliest possible organization of a Southern Confederacy and of a Southern army. The North is rapidly consolidating against us a strong government and a strong army with Jeff Davis for general in chief will bring them to a reasonable sense of the gravity of the crisis. I shall give the enemy a verbal shot next week before I retire from Congress. I say enemy, yes, I am theirs and they are mine. So he's a fanatic Southerner, at least in January of 1861, ready for the Confederacy. And why do I bring up this relatively forgotten man whom I'm guessing most viewers today have never heard of? Well, partly because he is one of the most politically influential Jewish Southern extremists before the American Civil War. Now, he was born in St. Thomas in what was then the Danish Virgin Islands, but he became one of Florida's founding fathers. He was a planter, he was a speculator, he was a railroad entrepreneur, he was also Florida's territorial, uh, he served in, the, in Florida's territorial legislature, and then he became Florida's territorial delegate to the United States Congress. And he was a delegate to the Florida Constitutional Convention, and he served two, two terms in the United States Senate. So here's uh, Senator David Uly. And he, you might be a little misled by his name, which doesn't sound particularly Jewish. Uh, he was born David Levy, uh, and uh, he grew up in a Jewish home in Norfolk, Virginia, where he had been sent uh, by his, uh, his father to, uh, to come of age. So he grows up in the home of a Jewish merchant in Norfolk uh, by the name of Moses Myers. Uh, but he apparently had to compromise his faith to get married. He wanted to marry the daughter of the former governor of uh, Kentucky, and uh, Governor Wycliffe, and her name was Nancy Wycliffe. And shortly before his marriage, he had his name officially changed by the Florida legislature uh, to David Uly instead of uh, Levy. And at any rate, he gets his name changed, becomes a Presbyterian. And ironically, this was months uh, after Florida's government had decided to name a county in his honor, Levy County, uh, Florida. Well, at any rate, um, that's, that's just an introduction to David uh, Uly. Now, what intrigues me is Uly's interest in getting Cuba annexed to the U U.S. as a new slave state. In December of 1845, he introduces a resolution as U.S. Senator from Florida uh, into the Congress, asked President Polk to negotiate Cuba's purchase with Spain, which then owned Cuba. It was not an independent nation. It was, it was a Spanish colony. And it was a colony with a very intense system of slave labor, uh, which uh, other than the United States was only present in a few places in the Western Hemisphere by then. It had been eradicated everywhere else. Uh, Brazil's the most notorious other case. But at any rate, uh, Yuli introduces a resolution to Congress asking President James Polk to initiate negotiations with uh, Spain <coughs> to buy Cuba. He withdraws it a few days later, saying he's doing this in deference to the wishes of several of his friends, but he's only doing so, quote, for the present. He, see, he, 
He's indicating that he plans to push for the annexation of this slave island to the United States in the future. And a few years later, in July of 1849, he sends a letter to the leading Southern radical politician, John C. Calhoun, saying that the South could safely stay in the Union if Texas was subdivided and Cuba were added to the Union. He said, this would put the South in a position to check any such increase in the free states as would settle their preponderance in, in the government. Well, what's he referring to? Well, he's writing this letter in 1849. And if you look over the situation at that time, which hadn't really changed since 1846 uh, very much, except for a uh, land added uh, by the Mexican war, which we'll, we'll get to later. But at any rate, uh, if you look at this map, you'll see the light blue states are free states in the Union. These uh, pinkish or whatever you would call this color states down here uh, were slave states. Now, what about the future? What, what, would, what would be likely to happen in the future? Well, you might know about the Missouri Compromise Line, which had been drawn as part of the Missouri Compromise of 1820. And if you, you look here, this uh, even lighter pinkish area down here was dedicated to slavery. That is, it, it, at the time it was uh, US territory. But if it, if, it was, if it was to become a state in the future, uh, or, if it was be, or if it would become an official US territory, it would be slave territory. Above this, you have a, a purplish area that's been dedicated to freedom. So if you look at the Louisiana Purchase, uh, everything is going to be free except for the small area down here. Sooner or later, the North is going to outnumber the South in the number of states. And in fact, because we get land from Mexico as part of the US-Mexican War, in 1850, California, which is off the map to the left, will become a free state. And for the first time, the North is going to have the most states. So the future looks uh, pretty dim. But uh, what, uh, what, what uh, Yuli is saying is, if you get Cuba added to the Union, some people were talking about adding it as more than one state, and then you subdivide Texas, because part of the Texas annexation deal back in 1845 was that if Texas wanted to be a bunch of smaller states instead of one big state, it could be five smaller states. Anyway, Yuli is saying we can still stay in the Union if we get a bunch of new slave states. And as part of this package, we need to get Cuba. Now, I'm not only fascinated by his interest in adding Cuba to the Union as a slave state, but that he's willing to do it by what was known as filibustering. Now, today, we think of filibustering as talking a bill to death. Uh, or uh, blocking it through Senate procedures, which is an issue in, in Congress as I, give this, as I give this talk, will the rules be changed? But before the Civil War, the term filibuster meant something entirely different. It meant groups of people setting out from their own country to invade other countries by private military expeditions without the permission of their own government. This was known as filibustering, and the United States was known as the greatest filibustering nation on earth. <clears throat> in fact, the United States had filibusters in progress virtually all the time, either in the planning stage or out in the field between the US-Mexican War and the Civil War. Now, filibustering was against the law. You can't have a private army at will deciding to invade a foreign country. You might start a, a war with that country for your own country. Uh, it might get you involved with a third party that might want to enter the war. You, you, could, uh, you could have a, a very large scale war if you don't watch out. So uh, filibustering was against international law and it was also against a US statute passed in 1818 known as the Neutrality Act, which said that if you either planned or invaded a foreign country on your own as part of a private military expedition, you could be thrown in jail for three years and you could be fined $3,000, which of course uh, today would be a, a sizable sum because of the uh, multiplied inflation 
since Civil War times. At any rate, despite these penalties, America addicted to filibustering between the U.S.-Mexican War and the U.S. Civil War. Now, there were expeditions and plots, especially against Mexico, but also against Cuba and also against other countries, particularly Nicaragua. Many hundreds of Americans landed in Cuba as part of filibuster expeditions in 1850 and 1851 with a uh, uh, Venezuelan native and ex Spanish official in Cuba by the name of Narciso Lopez. And uh, they actually landed on Cuban soil trying to uh, overthrow Spanish rule there in 1850 and 1851. Several thousands of Americans were involved in various expeditions to Central America in the 1850s uh, under uh, uh, an adventurer by the name of William Walker, a native Tennessean who went out uh, to Gold Rush, California and then got involved in filibustering. He first invaded Mexico, then he made a bunch of expeditions down to uh, Nicaragua. Uh, one of the leading filibusters of the time was the former governor of Mississippi, John Quitman. And uh, John Quitman spent a couple of years in the mid 1850s planning an expedition to uh, invade Cuba. The expedition involved newspaper editors, uh, the uh, originator of the phrase Manifest Destiny, uh, the, uh, uh, the governor of Alabama, Quitman himself, not only had been a uh, leading Mexican war general, but even go ex he was ex-governor of Mississippi, so on. Well, at any rate, filibustering is very important during this period. It seeps into American popular culture so that you've got sheet music, novels, uh, poetry all about the filibusters. Uh, there were plays uh, in, in theaters, stage plays about filibustering and so on. This will give you uh, a bit of a feel for filibustering. Uh, Narciso Lopez, head of the Cuban filibusters in 1850 and 1851 was finally captured by the Spanish and garroted to death uh, in Havana uh, in, in 1851, September of 1851. Uh, and um, other filibusters were shot by firing squad, which is what this, uh, this picture shows uh, after they were captured. William Walker, the leading U.S. filibuster who conquered Nicaragua for a while in, in 1855 to 1856 and got booted out in 1857. Uh, this is John Quibben, the U.S.-Mexican War hero who uh, plotted to conquer Cuba. Uh, here's a playbill of a play in New York City, Nicaragua, or General Walker's victories, uh, just to, to cover it all. And I've covered this whole movement in my book, Manifest Destiny's Underworld. So uh, the important thing is uh, this very, uh, the, this uh, U.S. Senator from Florida of Jewish extraction, David Uly, wants uh, the U.S. to get Cuba. He then decides to support the filibusters. And in May of 1850, during the first Lopez expedition uh, to Cuba, uh, the U.S. Navy tries to stop it. The Taylor administration, Zachary Taylor was Louisiana slave owner, plantation owner, but he did believe in upholding the law. And his secretary of the Navy, during this first uh, Lopez expedition to Cuba in May of 1850, uh, Secretary of the Navy writes, Captain of the U.S. Navy, Josiah Tatnell, commanding the war steamer Saranac, uh, he sends him to Havana Harbor, uh, basically to stop the filibusters. And these are the official water, uh, orders from the Taylor administration uh, to this U.S. Naval commander. And it says, should you ascertain that such hostile movement is on foot and is proceeding against Cuba? you will use all proper means in your power to prevent a landing. Should the expedition have effected a landing and a revolution in Cuba be in progress, you will prevent the landing of any reinforcements or arms. <coughs> in other words, the Taylor administration wants the Navy to stop the expedition, do anything possible to prevent its success. Our slavery expansion, happy U.S. Senator David Yuli 
is not happy with press reports that the Taylor administration is trying to prevent a U.S. conquest of Cuba. He introduces a resolution into, a, into the Senate and the Senate look into all this. And he says that Taylor is wrongly construing the U.S. Neutrality Act against filibustering. He says that this act should only apply in American waters. We should prevent Americans from leaving U.S. soil, but we don't have any right in foreign waters uh, to apply the act. He said that by doing this, the administration was interfering with the traditional right of emigration. If you're a U.S. citizen, you can emigrate wherever you want. You, you shouldn't be prevented by your own government from moving to a foreign country. Further, if a revolution broke out in Cuba against Spanish rule because of this landing, uh, for the U.S. government to interfere militarily would be to take sides in a revolution. And yet our own country was born in revolution. We believed in revolution. What right? We should stay neutral. He said that, uh, this is Senator Yuley again, that President Taylor was trying to, quote, crush a movement conceived in the spirit of liberty. Now, let's pause. What does all this lead to? What questions does it raise? Well, it makes me wonder, first of all, is Senator Yuley speaking only for himself? Second of all, is he speaking for other Southerners of Jewish background? And third of all, if he's representative of other Southerners of Jewish background, do we learn anything worth remembering about the role of Jews in the Old South? Because the South, as a region of America has had a long history of anti-Semitism uh, in the Ku Klux Klan and in other forms. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the famous Leo Frank uh, uh, hanging uh, and execution in Georgia. Uh, I don't want to get into all that, but it does raise some very interesting questions. So let's start with the issue. Was Senator Yuley the only politically prominent antebellum Southern Jew or quasi-Jew? Were there others who were famous, uh, famous politically and yet um, were of Jewish background? And the truth is in 1861, there were approximately 20,000 to 25,000 Jews in the 11 states that formed the Confederacy. Now, there were a number of Jews who had been politically active by that time. One of them, for instance, was a grocer named Isaac Marks in Orleans Parish in Louisiana, who became a delegate to the Louisiana Secession Convention in 1861. But there were only two Jews besides Yuli, only two Southern Jews, who I believe were truly prominent on the national political stage. One of them you may have heard about because he became the most well-known and most highly regarded of the uh, Confederate secretaries of state, Judah P. Benjamin. Now, like Yuli, Judah P. Benjamin was a Sephardic Jew. Now, what do we mean by Sephardic Jews? Uh, if you look at Europe, uh, they had two different branches of the Jewish faith. There were Eastern European Jews who tended to be more dark-skinned, and they were known as the Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, the more uh, fair-skinned Jews generally were uh, the Sephardic Jews of Spain and Portugal. Some of them wound up in North Africa, migrated to North Africa. Uh, others, and you have to remember that there was the big expulsion as part of the Spanish uh, Inquisition, and uh, they had to go somewhere. So some of them wind up going to the Americas. And Judah Benjamin is descended, uh, and so is Yuli, from Sephardic Jews who went to the Americas. So here's Judah Benjamin. His family moved to the United States. Uh, he, was, he was born in, in, on St. Croix in the Danish uh, Virgin Islands, uh, but the family moved to the United States in 1813, settled eventually in Charleston, and his parents ran a fruit stand on King Street in Charleston. He got the patronage of a prominent Jewish merchant who supported him, sent him off to Yale. Judah Benjamin, after his education, and he didn't graduate from Yale, but he goes down to New Orleans 
And he learns French, which you almost had to know to get ahead in uh, Louisiana, which was bicultural, even more so than, than it is today. And uh, at any rate, he got the, he, uh, he learned French. He was admitted to the bar, very successful lawyer. In fact, he was admitted to the bar of the U.S. Supreme Court to practice before it. Co-authored a legal digest with a man named Thomas Slidell. You're probably not familiar with Thomas Slidell, but you probably are familiar with Thomas Slidell's brother, John Slidell, became a Louisiana U.S. Senator and later uh, uh, became an important Civil War figure because he was the Confederacy's appointee as minister to the court of Louis Napoleon, Emperor Louis Napoleon in uh, in, in France. Uh, and uh, Benjamin formed a close association with his fellow uh, U.S. Senator John Slidell of Louisiana. They were, they were close allies in politics. At any rate, Benjamin had a, a very quick political rise in Louisiana once he became a lawyer. He was elected to the Louisiana House of Representatives in 1842. He served in both Louisiana state constitutional conventions 1844 to 1845, and then in 1852. He was elected to the Louisiana State Senate in 1852, and he was elected to the U.S. Senate to fill a vacancy shortly afterwards. He was never a member of a synagogue, but he did, uh, unlike uh, Yuli, identify himself fairly consistently as a, as a Jew, and he was recognized as a Jew by other Southerners, including some Southerners who had anti-Semitic stereotypes. Uh, Verena Davis, uh, the wife of the Confederate president wrote memoirs uh, after the Civil War. And uh, she mentions Benjamin and she says, his type was decidedly Hebrew. He had a very interesting marriage story. He married a Catholic of French extraction by Natalie St. Martin married her when she was very young. She was only 16, he was 21. Purchased a plantation for, for them that I showed on the previous side, uh, slide. I'll go back to it, but a, kind of a, tradi a traditional uh, Southern plantation with columns, very large. And uh, at any rate, she finds plantation life dull. Goes to France in 1845, taking with her their only child, and he winds up supporting the two of them the rest of uh, his life, occasionally visiting Paris to see them. And once they leave, Benjamin has his own mother move in with him at Belchasse, a plantation, and, and they, he never remarries. Okay, so you've got two very nationally prominent Southern Jews, uh, David Uly and Judah Benjamin. The third prominent Southern Jew is uh, more traditionally Jewish, Philip Phillips. He's born in Charleston in, uh, from a, a, an immigrant German father and an American born mother, studies law like the other two had, develops a successful practice, becomes secretary of Charleston's Reform Society of Israelites. So he's more of a self-conscious Jew. Marries a 16-year-old woman named Eugenia Levy of Charleston. They have nine children. And they move eventually to Mobile, Alabama, where he spends most of his antebellum years. Uh, he was a lawyer for the Bank of Mobile. Published a digest of the decisions of the Alabama Supreme Court. Has quite a political career serves in the state legislature. He's delegate to the 1852 Democratic National Convention. He was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1853. Stayed in Washington even after his congressional service was over in 1855. And he's still there at the start of the Civil War when his wife does some spying uh, for the uh, Confederates against, uh, against the Union. A Mary Chestnut, and the most famous Southern diarist probably of all time uh, and wrote her famous uh, diary from Dixie as it's sometimes called uh, that was later published. Uh, Mary Chestnut found Phillips's wife a bit of a flirt. 
She wrote in her diary in March 1861, uh, the, uh, the month after Jefferson Davis became president of the new Confederacy. She writes in her diary, I wish Mr. Mallory, referring to Jefferson Davis, the Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, I wish Mr. Mallory would not tell me so much of his flirtation with Mrs. Phillips. I do not think it is innocent as he pretends, but it is none of my business. Now, Phillips is extremely influential in national politics for one particular act that uh, you may not associate him with, but he played a key role in it. And I'm talking about the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which as much as anything brought on the Civil War because it uh, was a key turning point in the whole North-South dispute over slavery. Now, we all know that Stephen Douglas was the man most responsible for this very controversial law. Most of us know that the law was controversial because it more or less got rid of the old Missouri compromise line that I showed you in the previous slide that divided the Louisiana Purchase. As long as it divided the Louisiana Purchase, there weren't going to be any debates over slavery in the rest of the territory that had been acquired from France in 1803, as there had been over Missouri's admission to the Union in 1819, because it would be predetermined. Uh, territories that became states below the line would likely be uh, slave states because they, they, they were promised to slavery so long as they were territories. So slavery would become entrenched. Above the line, they were promised to freedom. So freedom would become entrenched. So at any rate, Stephen Douglas gets rid of that line. Why does he do it? Well, he wants to get a transcontinental railroad built across the northern part of that Louisiana Purchase territory that up till then hadn't been organized uh, into separate territories or states. Well, what, what Southerners object to is letting Douglas organize the territory formally uh, because that'll open it up to building the railroad. And that means that all these uh, more people will move west. Uh, you'll get territory, people in these territories and you'll get more and more free states. So they don't want to go along with Douglas's organizing uh, of this area to build the railroad. So he has to, he, they get a deal from him in which basically he'll erase the, uh, the Missouri Compromise Line, which means that slavery will be, op will be free to go into presumably area above the Missouri Compromise Line. Uh, well, uh, the, how do you word this exactly? Uh, the more harshly you word it will offend the North. If you say, I'm just repealing the Missouri Compromise, it was seen as a deal uh, with the South uh, that the North had agreed to. And so repealing it, revoking it would, would really anger Northerners. Well, at any rate, Douglas was trying to figure out how to do this to get Southern support without alienating Northerners. And along with Kentucky U.S. Senator John Breckinridge, uh, later a uh, Confederate general, uh, Douglas seeks out Philip Phillips for advice because Phillips had worked on uh, Alabama's uh, legal digest uh, and uh, he was known as a very well regarded lawyer. And um, Phillips uses his ability to split hairs and make the wording of the Kansas Nebraska Act more agreeable to the North, even though it's getting rid of a line, keeping slavery out of most of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, and um, this is explained in William Freeling's great book, The Road to Disunion, Volume One. And in this book, he gives the Southern Jew the spotlight. He says, not since the cotton gin had the patent office observed a Southern invention as faithful as Phillips's phraseology that the Compromise of 1821, while not repealed, should be declared inoperative and void in Kansas, Nebraska. So you're not repealing the, the, the uh, Missouri Compromise, you're just calling it inoperative and void. Well, at any rate, let's move on. The key thing is we're talking about uh, Southern interest in expanding slavery southward and the role of key Southern Jews in this movement. So where do Judah, Benjamin, Philip Phillips, the other two, leading Southern Jews before the Civil War stand on issues like Cuba and filibustering? Do they join Yuli in supporting the acquisition of a slave Cuba 
and if necessary, filibustering expeditions to Cuba to get it. Well, you might assume that Judah Benjamin was anti-filibustering because he was actually one of the U.S. government lawyers in prosecuting uh, the Narciso Lopez filibusters in 1850 and 1851. Uh, but uh, that was earlier. Uh, at any rate, let me let me quote you from what he says uh, in this uh, in the in the trial. One of Lopez's co-filibusters, a, a, a former U.S. senator from Mississippi, John Henderson, is put on trial first, and Benjamin becomes U.S. attorney to prosecute Henderson, earning a $5,000 fee for doing it, which uh, may well explain uh, why he's anti-filibustering in this particular case. And Benjamin says, and his uh, remarks as uh, U.S. attorney are quoted in uh, uh, the biography of, of Benjamin by Eli Evans. And Benjamin says, not a single movement has been made in Cuba. Not a ripple disturbs the smooth current of the life of that people. Not a single proof is given of their disaffection with their lot, meaning Spanish rule. The rich are busily engaging in rolling their sugar cane, gathering in their rich crops. The poor are eating tortillas, smoking cigars, swinging in hammocks, and sucking oranges. They do not appear to be troubled by their oppression or disturbed by their lot. Their independence is to be achieved for them by our young men who rejoiced in the outlandish name of filibuster. So Benjamin sounds like he's anti-filibuster and maybe anti-Cuba, but I think in this particular instance, he simply was earning the $5,000 fee. I think in fact, we can implicate both Judah and Benjamin and Philip Phillips in the crime of uh, supporting filibustering to end Spanish rule and add it to the South as slave states. We might call them, in fact, advisors to John Quitman's Cuba filibuster terrorist cell in 1854. Let's set the scene. It's 1854. For years, Spain has been under Spanish, uh, Spain has been under British pressure. And, and keep in mind, this is three years after uh, he had been, in, after Benjamin had been involved in prosecuting filibusters. So this is later. Uh, at any rate, uh, Britain had been pressuring Spain for years to end the African slave trade to Cuba and to end slavery in Cuba. Rumors start flying across the South in 1854 that Spain is going to finally bow to British pressure, that it's going to get rid of slavery in Cuba. Spanish authorities at this time proclaim all illegally imported slaves from Africa free. They called them emancipados. Now, uh, uh, of course, the African slave trade had been banned for some time, the international trade, and Spain had agreed uh, to oppose the African slave trade. But uh, nonetheless, slavery was sl so profitable in Cuba that many slaves, uh, thousands and thousands, have been imported into Cuba over the years. Now Spain's saying, oh, you're, you're, you're emancipated. The slaves are free if you've been illegally brought in in recent years. Uh, so they do that. The Captain General, the Spanish authority in Cuba, starts a registry to determine what Cuban slaves really deserve their freedom. The Captain General starts recruiting free blacks already in Cuba for Spain's occupation forces. So you're arming black soldiers in Cuba. And then in addition, they, they, they have an ongoing policy to bring in Chinese contract laborers who really would have lived pretty much like slaves, but the idea was replace black slaves with technically free Chinese laborers or coolie laborers as they were called. Now, Southerners find out what's going on in Cuba and they see a horrific threat to their future in America and to slavery's future in America. Cuba is near the Gulf Coast. Wouldn't Southern slaves eventually find out that Cuba was ending slavery? Wouldn't they get the idea that their slavery should end, their enslavement should end? Wouldn't enslaved black Southerners revolt for their own freedom? 
Now, when Southerners start talking about this plot uh, in, in the mid 1850s, they use the phrase that Spain intends to Africanize Cuba. And you can see this clipping here, progress of the Africanization scheme in Cuba. This is a dispatch from ha Havana, February 8th, 1854, that appears in the New York Times. Well, the former governor of Mississippi, John Quitman, is one of the Southerners most worried about the Africanization scheme in Cuba, the supposed Africanization scheme. Uh, he owns three plantations. He begins assembling men, ships, and arms for an invasion of Cuba. His ideas will do a preemptive strike. We'll seize it before Spain can fully implement its policies to emancipate the slaves. Because once the slaves are emancipated, Number one, they might oppose our landing. Number, number two, they certainly, we'd, we'd, you know, they'd, they'd have a legal claim to freedom. And uh, we don't want that. We want to move in quickly with a preemptive strike, stop Spain from implementing its, eman its emancipation policies uh, and uh, it, its, its plans to arm slaves to stop a U.S. invasion. Let's just get in there quickly. Then once we've conquered the island, thrown out the Spanish military, we're going to proclaim Cuba an independent republic. Now you might wonder why don't they just annex it right away? Well, if they're declared an independent republic, it means that like the Republic of Texas for a, a, an interim period, they can make their own laws. They can get rid of all the Spanish laws, freeing, freeing slaves formally, um, and uh, all the uh, protection, all the, all the rules undermining slavery that Spain had, had passed over the years. And then once slavery is secure in Cuba, like Texas, which had a decade of freedom before it, it, it became annexed to the Union uh, as an independent republic, then we'll ask Congress to admit us as a slave state. And because you're being admitted by Congress by joint resolution like Texas was, that means we're taking you with your own rules. Uh, you're not gonna go through a territorial phase as a US territory. Congress makes the rules for, for territories. Congress can ban slavery in territories. Uh, you, you bypass that danger. So that's what Quitman had in mind. Now he probably wouldn't have started this plot had he not expected the new, the new U.S. president to support him, unlike Taylor, who, remember, opposed Cuban filibustering. Well, who's the new U.S. president? He is a New Englander, Franklin Pierce, but he had been a general in the Mexican War, and he was known to favor U.S. territorial expansion. In his inaugural address, Franklin Pierce had announced that he wouldn't be, he wouldn't shy away from territorial expansion. You can't imagine a U.S. president today, president, say President Biden had said, uh, I, I intend the United States to take over other countries. I mean, it, it's absurd. It would endanger the U.S. Uh, US diplomacy, might get us involved in, in wars. Uh, Franklin Pierce actually announced in his inaugural address that the U.S. would be expanding into new countries. Uh, he appoints pro-filibustering men to his cabinet and diplomatic positions. Uh, he, he appoints as the U.S. minister to Portugal, a man who had been twice arrested in the U.S. for supporting the Lopez filibusters years earlier. At any rate, Quitman expects President Pierce to support him. Instead, Pierce shocks Quitman and his supporters by issuing an anti-filibustering proclamation in Taylor's spirit. Uh, it's dated May 31st, 1854. It says that the Pierce administration will not fail to prosecute with due energy any U.S. citizens disobeying our neutrality law and invading Cuba. Now, two letters that I found in the Quitman papers at Harvard University expose the fact that both these other two Southern Jews, Philip Phillips and Judah Benjamin, were connected with the Quitman filibuster conspiracy. Phillips was obviously a key mediating figure between the filibusters, Quitman and his followers, 
and President Pierce. That is to say, he was a go-between trying to get Pierce to reverse his, uh, his, his declaration against filibustering and get Pierce to support an invasion of Cuba. How do I know this? Well, Joseph Lesesny writes Quitman on June 8th, 1854, about a week after the, the President Pierce's proclamation, uh, he writes to Quitman from Mobile, Alabama. So this is an Alabama lawyer named Lesesny writing to Quitman from Mobile. And he writes, our representative in Congress, remember Phillips was representing Alabama, uh, our representative in Congress, Colonel Phillips, is here in Mobile on a short visit during the recess taken by the two houses at Washington. He is reported to be specially favored with executive confidence, meaning he's a confidant of President Pierce. And I was therefore particularly anxious to learn the true sentiment which dictated the president's recent proclamation against Americans participating in filibustering expeditions. I infer from the general tone of Phillips's conversation that is probably the last we shall hear from the president on the subject, unless our friends are extremely imprudent and needlessly public in their movements. In other words, if Quitman plans his expedition privately, doesn't get written up in headlines, uh, Pierce will leave him alone. That way, as, as long as he doesn't embarrass Pierce by being too public. And then the letter goes on. Am I saying to the president that the proclamation had been received with disfavor? And if followed by any practical measure, prevention would render General Pierce the most odious man alive to the Southern people. He, meaning the president, remarked significantly that perhaps the president didn't mean any more than General Jackson did by his own proclamation against the volunteers in Texas. That is, Americans who basically filibustered Texas to help get Texas its independence. The president, if, if the president spoke sincerely, I infer he, he knows the fact uh, that, um, excuse me, if Phillips, he's talking about Phillips, if, Phil, if Phillips spoke sincerely, I infer that he knows the fact that the president will not willingly see anything we do and really wishes us success. So Philip Phillips had gotten word from Pierce back to the filibusters. Basically, Pierce won't take action against them so long as they don't get in the headlines. Now, similarly, Judah Benjamin was a filibuster consultant a Louisiana planter named Samuel Walker wrote Quitman the very next month, in July of 1854. He's writing from New York City, explaining why, except for Judah Benjamin and, and Slidell, his cohort, politicians in Washington don't get why you can't just buy Cuba, why you have to conquer with a filibuster expedition first. But, Phillips get, but, but Benjamin gets it, uh, Walker says in this letter. Uh, so this is what Walker writes. I took passage for Washington. During my travels, I heard little or nothing on the matter which interests the South so deeply. Whenever I did mention Cuba, I found the question was misunderstood. I tell you, the Pierce administration trembles before filibusterism. The words spoken in their offices puts them on nettles, but they still pretend it will be bought. I told them, Buying it was the worst thing that could be done for the South, and the very thing we did not desire, that we would make her independent in spite of the administration's desire to buy it. Mr. Slidell is with Mr. Benjamin, the only men who understand the matter. Now, we know that Judah Benjamin is worried about the Africanization of Cuba from a speech he gave three months earlier in the U.S. Senate on May 1st discussing a motion in Congress to suspend the neutrality law so that filibustering to Cuba can be temporarily legal. Benjamin says, I concur that the existence of a scheme for the Africanization of Cuba and for the establishment of a Negro state nominally independent, and yet under the virtual protectorate of England, France, and Spain has been conclusively established by the evidence that has been placed before the Senate. I deem it the duty of this government, the U.S., promptly to oppose the carrying out of a policy so fraught with danger to our southern constituencies. In other words, um, if, if we don't get rid of the Neutrality Act so that the filibusters can go into Cuba, England, France, and Spain will protect Spanish rule of Cuba and making Cuba a Negro uh, state uh, there. That's what he's saying. 
Five years later, in 1859, Benjamin speaks out again on Cuba, not only endorsing a bill to offer Spain $30 million to buy Cuba, but also making it clear that he believes in the necessity of Cuba having slavery and that this is important for the South. Uh, Benjamin wants to buy Cuba for 30 million and he, he talks about Cuba as <coughs> an intertropical island whose external commerce reaches nearly $80 million, lies at our door. The first leading fact which ought to be kept constantly in view is that the wealth and productivity of this island have been created and their continuance can only be secured by a system of compulsory labor. If the experience of mankind has solved a single industrial problem, we may fairly assume as granted that tropical productions can be maintained on a scale to meet the requirements of civilized man by compulsory labor alone, meaning slavery. The fruits of the Southern states of the Spanish islands of Cuba and Puerto Rico and of the Brazilian empire immeasurably exceed in value similar products of other states and countries of this hemisphere of like soil and climate cultivated by free labor. Now, there's scattered evidence that other Southern Jews were involved in filibustering. The Jew Jewish merchant in New Orleans, Isaac Marx, publicly collected funds for the Lopez expedition. If you read Bertram Wallace Korn's book, Early Jews of New Orleans, you find out that Meyer Cohn, a lawyer and public figure, uh, he was a member of the New Orleans Law Association and so on, he presided over a mass meeting in 1851 to protest the execution of Lopez and the other filibusters by Spanish authorities after their failed landing in Cuba. And there were probably some Southern Jews who participated in actual filibustering. Uh, if you look at um, this Judah Benjamin speech in the Senate for Cuba in 1859, if, if you look at this book about Walker's expedition to Nicaragua um, by William Wells, published in 1856, Wells had been in, involved in the, in the movement. Um, Wells talks about a private named uh, Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R, who was wounded at a key battle uh, in uh, Nicaragua that Walker's army fought apparently survived because the New Orleans, or rather the New York Daily Tribune in 1857, enlisting Walker survivors who made it back from Nicaragua to Boston on the U.S. sloop of war, Cyane, uh, at any rate, it listed a John Mayer uh, as one of the survivors. So that correlates. And then I find out later on uh, that uh, there was a Natchez, Mississippi Jew named John Mayer who organized local home guard during the Civil War and actually played a role in firing on Union forces landing at Natchez uh, during the Civil War, which led to a short uh, battle, the only time Natchez came under fire in the Civil War. And certainly Edwin Moyes, uh, who was U.S. District Attorney in Eastern, Eastern District of Louisiana, uh, seems to have been pro-filibuster. He's, pro, he's, he's a U.S. district attorney, and the government wants him to stop, the U.S. government wants him to stop the Quitman play, plot against Cuba. And what he basically does is, in a couple of letters back to the State Department, he just kind of poo-poos the idea that Quitman could even be planning to invade Cuba. He writes U.S. Secretary of State William Marcy in December of 1853, I acknowledge receipt of your letters in relation to rumors of an expedition against Cuba. These rumors have their origin at the North and are not credited here. In other words, we don't believe them here in New Orleans. So finally, is there any significance that these various Jews and especially the three most significant Jews in, in, in the whole na nation and in, in before the Civil War, that they had links to slavery expansion and to filibustery. Well, I want you to consider the thesis, rather surprising one, given the history of anti-Semitism in the South in the last 150 years or so. I want you to consider the surprising thesis of Robert Rosen, who wrote a book called The Jewish Confederates. Rosen took, takes note of the following. 
He notes that the first constitution in American history, giving Jews religious freedom, was actually a Southern constitution. It was issued by the proprietors of the Carolina colony in 1669. It was called the Fundamental Constitutions. And it offered religious freedom to quote, ye heathens, Jews, and other dissenters. Rosen also notes that David Uly and Judah Benjamin were the first US senators in history of Jewish descent. So Jews, the first Jewish senator did not come from New York City, as you might guess. He was a Southern Jew. Points out that Judah Benjamin's likeness is on the Confederate $2 bill. Apparently, Judah Benjamin is the only Jewish American ever on a piece of US currency, and he's on a Confederate bill. He argues that Southern Jews adjusted to Southern racial mores before the Civil War. A small percentage of them acquired slaves of their own. More importantly, no prominent Southern Jew ever attacked slavery, became an abolitionist. And apparently most Southern Jews were willing to fight for slavery and the Confederacy in the Civil War. Private Eugene Le Levy of New Orleans in October of 1864, this is towards the end of the war, he objects to uh, proposals that the Confederates were floating to free male slaves and put them in the Confederate army. If they'll fight for the Confederacy, get us independent, we'll let you have your freedom at the end of the war. Private Levy of New Orleans is very worried. He says the principle that slaves are in their proper sphere as they are at present situated within the boundaries of the Confederacy is one of the grand incentives to the waging of war against the United States. So knowing this, you can guess Rosen's incredible thesis, totally unexpected to me before I read the book. Antebellum Southern Jewry experienced a freedom unknown to Jews anywhere else in the world. They had been accepted by their fellow citizens of the Old South, more accepted as Jews than at any other time since the golden age of Jewry in medieval Spain. I would argue the Jewish involvement in filibustering and the movement for slavery expansion before the Civil War validates Rosen's thesis that Southern Jews became so assimilated into Southern institutions that they wanted them protected and extended now, there were a few incidents of anti-Semitism in the Confederacy. Judah Benjamin was derided as being a Semite uh, by uh, some uh, 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 Jew-hating uh, Southerners. Uh, I think the, the stresses of the Civil War, uh, the, the uh, inflation, uh, the, uh, the hoarding that went on, the, uh, the, the lack of supplies, a starvation in some areas, I think it turned people to looking for scapegoats and they found, uh, they found Jewish merchants easy scapegoats to make for their own misery. Uh, but uh, that's another story. Uh, at any rate, uh, what I hope you've done is first learn something about uh, Southern slavery expansion before the Civil War. Uh, we always think of, of slavery trying to go into the West, much of which uh, was inhospitable to uh, plantation culture. Uh, we often forget that it was trying to go southward, that leading Southerners were very much involved in this movement, including, I might say, uh, Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens, and that Southerners in many cases tried to get it to go southward through the agency of filibustering expeditions. Uh, I've written quite a bit on these expeditions. Uh, I've just uh, put up here uh, my, my various books that, that either treated in whole or in, in part. Uh, but uh, I hope, and then finally, um, that uh, I hope you've learned something about Southern Judaism and uh, the whole issue of assimilation in American history, anti-Semitism, where it comes from, 
and so are, and I hope I've raised some, uh, some food for, for future thought. But at any rate, uh, that's, uh, that, that's my talk for today. Thank you to the Civil War Roundtable Congress.